Hi, this is Pastor John. Welcome to the Gospel Grace video channel, where we extend God's grace into our troubled world. We have several ministries, as shown on the slide and below the video, which contain many biblical teachings. My author's website is also listed, which describes the books I have written. This true Christianity video is the first of many videos to come, and it starts right at the very center of what true Christianity is all about, and explains how to become a true Christian. Many believers and unbelievers make the same wrong assumption that Christianity is a religion. Christianity is not a religion. Instead, it is a personal relationship with God the Father through Jesus Christ. When Jesus and his word speak of the church, he is not referring to a building or a denomination. Instead, the word for church in the Bible, ecclesia in Greek, refers to the entire body of believers in heaven and on earth, specifically the called out ones. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Matthew 16 verse 18. He did not mean a particular building, congregation, or denomination, but rather all true Christians. That's why the Apostle Paul wrote, Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 27. Whenever humans attempt to structure our relationship with God into an organization, it becomes defiled by human ideas and man-made traditions. Jesus told the Pharisees that this was their problem. For laying aside the commandments of God, you hold the tradition of men. Mark 7, verse 8. Paul also pointed out this problem. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. Colossians 2, verse 8. That doesn't mean that Christians aren't supposed to congregate, for, as Paul wrote, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another. Hebrews 10, verses 24 and 25. The purpose of congregating is not to build up a huge congregation requiring investment in expensive buildings, but rather to stir up love and good works, as well as exhorting, encouraging one another. The early disciples met in homes as the early Christian church grew. James, Jesus' brother and head of the church in Jerusalem, reiterated this focus by defining religion in a unique but illustrative way. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. James 1, verse 27. But the moment that different groups form, divisions and competition result, just as the Apostle Paul warned the Corinthian church. For where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? 1 Corinthians 3, verses 3 to 4. Paul beseeched the Corinthians to instead join together in unity. Now I plead with you, brother, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, 
but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 10. That doesn't mean that each group of congregating Christians must all speak, act, and do things exactly the same way. There can be differences in style, but not in biblical substance. Gathering together in separate groups is necessary due to location and logistics. Nevertheless, Jesus still calls on us to be one. Jesus prayed that all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. John 17, verse 21. One of the primary reasons that many in today's world don't believe in Jesus is that they see all these denominations and divisions among Christians. Instead of operating in unity and one accord, we are sending a mixed message of confusion and dissension. No wonder so many people reject Christianity as a religion without understanding that organized religion is what has diluted the message of establishing a personal relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul gave us the prescription for oneness in Christ. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called with all lowliness and gentleness, with long-suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Ephesians 4, verses 1 to 6. So then, how do we form a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? The first and most important step is to be truly born again. As Jesus told Nicodemus, a Pharisee leader who was caught up in the traditions of men, having added thousands of rules to the law given by God to Moses. Jesus said, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. John 3, verses 5 and 6. Being born of water represents our physical birth as when the woman's water breaks forth. No one can connect to God through the physical realm. Instead, we must be born a second time spiritually. For God is spirit, as Jesus told the woman at the well. He said, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. John 4, verse 24. It doesn't matter what we do or think in the physical world. If we don't establish a spiritual connection with God, we cannot establish a personal relationship with him. That's why we must receive Jesus Christ into our hearts. Intellectual belief is not enough. Only when we receive him into our heart does his Holy Spirit take up residence within us. As the Apostle Paul wrote, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts 
through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Ephesians 3 verses 14 to 19. So that's the treasure that awaits us within the fullness of God and the riches of his kingdom. Paul admonished the Christians who were struggling with sin. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? 1 Corinthians 6 verse 19. And Jesus told the Pharisees that the kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, see here or see there. For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. Without the indwelling Holy Spirit, we are not born again, but remain spiritually dead and unsaved. Many people who call themselves Christians are not born again. How do we tell the difference? Jesus says, by their fruits you will know them. In Matthew 7, verses 16 to 20, he said, you will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. The Apostle Paul explained how to identify these fruits. He wrote, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Galatians 5, verses 22 to 23. He also tells us how to identify those whose fruits come from the flesh, that is, from worldly, physical desires. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Galatians 5, verses 19 to 21. Being born again doesn't mean we don't sin on occasion, but the Spirit within us will lead us to godly repentance and a desire to turn away from ungodliness. And of course, because of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, God will forgive us our sins when we confess and repent. 1 John 1 9 says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Those who claim to be Christians but are not truly born again are what I call pseudo-Christians or fake Christians who will generally not feel godly remorse over their sins but attempt to justify them. Pseudo-Christians will often say they are sorry but don't truly return, repent and turn away from their sins. That's why the Apostle Paul says we must have godly sorrow. He wrote, Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner, 
that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of this world produces death. 2 Corinthians 7 verses 9 and 10. Once we have the Spirit of God dwelling within us, we are a changed human being, spiritually reborn. Our desires and focus will change from worldly to godly, and we can then connect at any moment of time with God through the Spirit to receive guidance and redirection. Paul wrote, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. 2 Corinthians 5.17 And to the Ephesians he wrote, But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Ephesians 4 verses 20 to 24. However, this personal relationship, this spiritual connection that must be nurtured, practiced. Far too many born-again Christians neglect the flame that burns within. It will fade, but never go out completely. However, the Spirit won't manifest in our lives if it's not burning brightly. That's why Jesus admonished the church in Ephesus despite their good works, to return to their first love when the flame did burn bright. He said, Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Revelation 2, verse 4. The primary ways of keeping the flame of passion alive are through prayer, thanksgiving, praise, and worship. The Bible prescribes how we are to approach God. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. Psalm 100 verses 1 to 2 and 4. Always start your prayers off with giving thanks to God for everything good in your life before you begin asking for his help. Praise him for who he is, a loving, merciful, gracious God. He doesn't need your praises. You do. Praising him lifts you up, gives you renewed perspective, and gets your focus off your problems and onto the eternal life to come which has no pain, suffering, or death, just pure bliss and joy. That's why scripture reminds us to keep an eternal perspective, to rise above worldly ills. Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Colossians 3, verses 1 to 4. Again, Scripture says, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, Whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report. If there is any virtue, and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Worship, that is, 
Singing praises to God is also prescribed in Scripture for establishing a close connection with God. God loves to hear your joyful noises, whether harmonious or not. But even more importantly, it lifts up your spirit and wakens the Holy Spirit within, who is alive within you. The psalmist wrote, O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. Psalm 95, verses 1 and 2. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with sounding cymbals. Praise him with loud clashing cymbals. That's in Psalm 150 verses 1 to 6. And Paul wrote, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Colossians 3, verse 16. Having established a personal relationship with Jesus, that's step one in becoming a true Christian, step two is extending his love into the world. True born-again Christians are not haters, as much of the secular world believes us to be. Unfortunately, many pseudo-Christians are haters and have given true Christianity a bad rap. True Christians know that Jesus said, love is the most important of all the commandments, and that we are supposed to love God and love everyone else. He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's in Matthew 22, verses 37 to 39. To further make the point that true Christians are supposed to love everyone, Jesus says that we are also supposed to love our enemies. He said, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, Love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. That's in Matthew 5, verses 43 to 45. This is the lesson from the parable about the Good Samaritan. Jews and Samaritans hated one another back in Jesus' time. But in the parable, a Jew lay injured by the roadside. But the priest and the Levite passed him by. But a Samaritan stopped and helped him. So Jesus asked the Jewish lawyer, So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And the lawyer said, He who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said, Go and do likewise. Jesus also says that loving other Christians and just those who love us is of no credit to us. He said, For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? That's in Matthew 5, verses 46 to 47. The phrase tax collectors is used as a euphemism 
for those the Jews despised, since the tax collectors worked for the Roman Empire, who ruled cruelly over them. Loving everyone doesn't mean that we agree with or approve of everyone's actions, but we must first of all love them as Christ Jesus loves us, despite our sinfulness. In 1 John 4, verses 19 to 21, it says we shall love him because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. The use of the word brethren is collective, meaning everyone especially within the context of the previous scriptures. If we don't have love for everyone, the Apostle Paul says, whatever we say or do is meaningless. He wrote, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have becoming sounding brass or a clagging cymbal. Though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 to 3. That doesn't mean we shouldn't speak out about the things of God, but that we do so out of a heart filled with love, not with hate or anger, but rather we are supposed to speak the truth in love, as it tells us to do in Ephesians 4.15. In love, not an anger or a holier-than-thou attitude, that does not lead anyone to repentance and salvation. That's why Jesus said, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone. In today's contentious world, too many people, Christians included, are staking out positions and defending them with great fervor. Mask or no mask, vax or no vax, Trump or no Trump. Then they tend to castigate others, pointing their fingers and their anger toward those taking the opposite position. But that's the role of Satan, to point fingers and accuse. For he is the accuser of the brethren, and that's in Revelation 12, verse 10. What believers and unbelievers alike fail to recognize is that we all make mistakes, which ought not divide us. Romans 3, 23 tells us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And 1 John 1 verse 8 says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But many people think that some sins are greater than others, some abominations and others inconsequential. But God's word tells us that no sin is greater than another, despite these worldly perceptions. James 2 verse 10 says, For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. Since we are all sinners in God's eyes, it is as though we are all guilty in the courts of heaven. 
That's why he sent his son to die for us and why Jesus insists that we love everyone regardless of what sin they might have committed. If you have unrepented sin, regardless of how minor you think it to be, it separates you from God, which is why your prayers are being hindered. Just as Isaiah 59 verses 1 to 2 tells us, it says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy that it cannot hear, but your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. Our sins are the works of the flesh, that is, the lusts of our sinful nature that we all inherit in our fallen world. Even the Apostle Paul struggled with sin. He wrote, As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature, for I have a desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. That's in Romans 7, verses 17 to 19. It is especially difficult in these last days when all kinds of temptations are thrust at us from every direction. God, through the Apostle Paul, accurately prophesied what these days would be like in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1-4. to But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. Division, discord, and discrimination are running rampant these days. But the Bible says that such things are wrong and those who are caught up in them are not displaying God's love, but rather Satan's wrath. James 2 verses 8 and 9 warns, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. 1 John 3 verses 15 and 16 makes an even sterner warning. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. None of us is perfect, which is why we all need a Savior and why we all need to love one another, not condemn those we disapprove of. Jesus paid the penalty for all our sins and therefore is the only means by which we can be reconciled back to the Father. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 18 says, Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. And in 1 Timothy 2 verses 5 to 6, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself a ransom for all. 
God loves every one of us and does not want us to live separated from him for all of eternity. As the Apostle John wrote, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. John 3, verses 16 and 17. Don't allow anger and hatred to separate from you from your Creator. And when you do fall short and sin, which you will, turn to Jesus with godly sorrow, and he will forgive you and cleanse you from all that unrighteousness. Be filled with God's love and go forth in that love and spread it all around. That's the way of Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. John 14, 6. And that's the way of all true Christians. <laughs>